Hi everyone, I'm Silent K and welcome to The Cinephile. It's where we've got some fun film facts for your viewing pleasure. Level of pleasure enjoyed is uh, entirely up to you. Of course, before we start, don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell so you get notified every time I post a new vid. Did you uh, need a sound effect for that bell? No, God! No, God, please, no, no! Got it. So this cinephile is about the movie Irresistible starring Steve Carell and Rose Byrne. It's good to see you. Yeah. You look fat. <laughs> I'll lay out the plot to this in a second, but first, let's get to some randoms. So as I said, Steve Carell stars in the film, which was actually directed by his longtime friend, John Stewart. John, Late Night Misses You. I will try to only mention that like one time in this. Stewart is partially responsible for Carell breaking into Hollywood because he casts Steve as a correspondent on The Daily Show. We are definitely gonna have a conversation about Daily Show correspondence in just a tick. Trust. These two have been friends for decades, and during breaks in shooting this film, they stopped to take pictures and sign autographs together for fans that surrounded the set. Another interesting tidbit, this is the second movie Jon Stewart has written and directed. The first was Rosewater, which is about a journalist being detained in Iran under suspicion of being a spy, so yeah. Not a comedy. This one is a comedy though, which is definitely in Stewart's wheelhouse. But let me be clear, Rosewater is a decent flick. You should definitely check it out if you haven't. Very respectable showing for a first time filmmaker. Now Irresistible is about a democratic strategist who is helping a retired vet run for mayor in a town that leans Republican. It's like Titans battling on the mortal coil. You know what I mean? Like the Republican party and the Democratic party, you know, this is just a small town and they bring in their entire, the, the entire weight of those two political machines and they sort of, it's its Batman versus Superman. So there's comedy, there's politics. It's kind of like Jon Stewart took one of his old Daily Show monologues and turned it into a flick, which actually kind of makes sense. Let me explain. This movie is loosely based on the 2017 special election for Georgia's sixth congressional district. I dig movies because they help me escape from political upheaval, especially these days. But let me see if I can break this one down for you as painlessly as possible. In 2017, Tom Price gave up his seat in the U.S. House of Representatives to join the cabinet of President Trump. He became Donald's first secretary of health and human services. Side note, that turned out to be a pretty crappy career move because this dude got caught up in a huge scandal. Shocking, I know. Apparently he had an affinity for using private jets and military aircraft to get around, which is a big no-no. He cost the taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars and resigned the cabinet position just seven months after getting it. But when he resigned from Congress, under state law, Georgia had to hold a special election. Shockingly, in a historically red district, Democrat John Ossoff seemed to be likely to win. When all the ballots were counted, he ended up with 48.2% of the vote, way in front of his closest opponent, Karen Handel, who took in 19.8% of the vote. Extra, extra, Democrat wins by landslide right? Uh, not so fast. The law says for someone to win a special election, he or she has to receive at least 50% of the vote. And Ossoff came up about two points short. So that led to a runoff election between Ossoff and Handel. Now this thing starts to pick up serious national attention. Both the Dems and the GOP just opened their vaults. The money came pouring in, making this the most expensive congressional race in American history to the tune of $55 million. Where does that money go and, and how is it used for its own influence and how does the system protect itself? When it was all said and done, Handel won with 51% of the vote to Ossoff's 48. Just to close the loop here, Handel lost the general election about a year later to another Democrat and is challenging Lucy McBath in November 2020. Ossoff is the Democratic nominee for the Georgia Senate seat opening up in the same election cycle. I see lots of room for comedic moments in here, so I'm not surprised Stewart was inspired by this. Let's check out the roster and see who helped put this thing together. There's a few faces you might recognize right away, like Will Sasso. He's this guy. You know the old saying? Fuck Chinese and you're horny again a half hour later. Then there's Bruce Altman. That's this guy. I want to go around and meet the funk really with all the top divorce attorneys in your area. That way, if worse happens, none of them can take her on as a client. Conflict of interest. It's pretty good. Just do it, fella. Natasha Leone is in the movie. Anytime we can kind of, you know, use uh, comedy or the arts to kind of shed a light in a greater sense of, about the um, absurdity of the situation that we find ourselves in um, is always great. There was a time when she was best known for the American Pie movies, if you can believe that, but now it's more for this. Look at you, Blondie, what'd you do? Aren't you not supposed to ask that question? I read that you're not supposed to ask that. You read that? Are you going to study for prison? Also, if you haven't watched her in Russian Doll on Netflix, you are seriously missing out. That show is original, funny, and freaking dark, man. Big Silent K Reco on that one. Next up is Topher Grace. This is an easy movie to sign on to. I 
I mean, I, I don't know if I was the biggest fan of The Daily Show, but I challenge anyone to to say they watched more episodes or, or loved it more than I did. You mostly know him from that 70s show or possibly this scene from Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, I'm not talking about that. Bellas, Bellas. All okay. red. <laughs> yeah. Shut up, dog. All red. Yeah, I told you. you know it. Oh, or maybe this temper tantrum in Ocean's 12. Jesus Christ, are you people retarded? It says do not disturb. It's me. But he's pretty forgettable on all these other movies. I mean, no, yeah, forgettable's the right word. Oscar winner Chris Cooper plays Carell's political project. He's one of those character actors you see all the time, but for some reason forget his name. I am uh, Colonel Jack Hastings, and I am running for mayor. In case you were wondering where else you know him from, he won the Oscar for Adaptation, which I'm betting you thought he won for American Beauty. He was also in The Town, Capote, and the first two Bourne movies, and that's just a smattering, really. Then you've got Rose Byrd, who's really been stepping up her comedy game lately. One of the strongest things about the script was that no one's safe. Everyone's being made fun of, and Democrats, Republicans, feminists, anti-feminists. Uh, it, it's, it's poking fun in a really important way, in a really healthy way. When she started her career, she was mostly known for dramas, but then get him to the Greek happened. And the comedy stuff took off. Since then, she's been in Bridesmaids, Spy, Neighbors, Neighbors 2, Instant Family, Like a Boss, and now this. Her and Corral seem like a pretty good fit. What is your problem, What's babe? your problem? Seriously, that's what? just like you just start inventing things? Deer locking? I'm basically from Deer Lock. No, you're not even I close. You, we went to law school. Bad. Don't throw that at him. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh my god, you are you're such... You're so funny. You're so uptight. You're an ass. You're so funny. Speaking of our leading man, Corella is pretty bankable when it comes to comedies. I thought, here's a, you know, ostensibly a political comedy, but it's really not so much about the politics themselves, in my mind. It's about the human beings that get caught in the middle. I'm not trying to ignore his dramatic turns, but we'd be here all day. As I said before, The Daily Show put him on the map, and then he did this in Bruce Almighty. <laughs> That's all it took. Then he was Brick in Anchorman. I love desk. Brick, are you just looking at things in the office and saying that you love them? I love lamp. Do you really love the lamp, or are you just saying it because you saw it? I love lamp. Then he landed the office, which put him in millions of homes across the country. Abraham Lincoln once said that if you're a racist, I will attack you with the North. And those are the principles. Damn it. Okay, sorry. Michael Scott earned him a Golden Globe too, by the way. That same year, he starred in his first film lead role as the 40-year-old virgin. Freddie Pyle! Como se llama? No, Kelly Clarkson! Little side piece for you here, the woman waxing him in this scene lied to the casting director to get the role, so when you see her fighting back laughter, it's for real, because she didn't know what she was doing. Gotta fake it till you make it, right? After that, Carell was officially a household name. Other comedies include Evan Almighty, Get Smart, Date Night, Despicable Me, Dinner for Schmucks, The Incredible Burt Wonderstone, Despicable Me Again, Anchorman Again, Minions, and then the other Despicable Me. I know, there's a lot of dramas in that time frame, so sue me. I will mention Foxcatcher, though, because that did get him his only Oscar nomination. So it's pretty clear Steve has the comedy chops to lead this crew in front of the camera, and Stewart is no funny man slouch behind it. He had a brief run as an actor in bit parts like this. But, uh, I am real glad you're all here tonight because I'm about to do something that I never thought I'd have the guts to do. Um, you're not proposing, are you? Uh, yeah, pal, I am. Well, think about it, you know? God, Sonny, shut up! Anyway, uh, will you? Yeah. 
but he really made his mark by turning The Daily Show into a must-watch for 16 years. If you only know The Daily Show with Trevor Noah as the host, you have no idea what you missed out on. The insanely popular political satire and commentary we see today, Jon Stewart was the grandpappy of them all. Colbert's monologues, Meyer's closer looks, Bee's rants, Oliver's entire show, they all came from the way Jon Stewart told the news. To that end, three of the four people I just named got their start on his Daily Show, as well as a who's who of people making you laugh today. So let's dive into what a difference Jon Stewart has made to the comedy landscape by giving insanely funny people a voice. And apparently he's a total mensch, which makes me love this list even more. I said Samantha B. Yup, she was a correspondent. Have you had your picture taken with a black person yet? Well, I don't think so, but I wouldn't mind doing it. That's something you'd be willing to try? Why, certainly. There's plenty of them. I know. Do you have any of them in Montana? We don't, you know? We don't have any. Uh, in fact, uh, I guess our kids were pretty old before they saw one. Remember that him being a mensch part I mentioned just a few seconds ago? Check out this clip from Samantha's last time on his show. Please welcome our senior, senior correspondent, correspondent, Samantha B. Did you hear that? If you listen really closely, you can hear Stuart whisper to her, I know you hate this, but you're the best. Listen again. I'm not crying, you're crying. Dan Back at all was on Stuart's Daily Show, but you'll probably remember him most from being that foul-mouthed senator on Veep. Oh, look what we have here. Not only Ginger Rogers, but also Ginger Rogers. <sighs> nice joke construction, sir. Stop trying to polish my dick, you fucking four-eyed failure. Okay. There's Rob Riggle. You've seen him in everything. Gentlemen. We've got some good news and we've got some bad news. The good news is we found your Mercedes. <laughs> That's great news. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's over at Impound right now. We picked it up at uh, 5 a.m. this morning, parked in the middle of Las Vegas Boulevard. Then there's the brothers Cordry, which I'm betting you didn't even know they were brothers. Let's start with Nate. Hi, fella. <laughs> you want to step over here a second? Now. Who are you? <laughs> I'm Chris Hansen from Dateline. <laughs> Can I ask what the heck you were doing coming to see a 12-year-old girl in the middle of the night? That clip was from Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, which was an Aaron Sorkin creation that no one watched for some reason. It was West Wing-style dialogue driving a show like Saturday Night Live. This was like a repeat performance of Sports Night for Sorkin, which if you don't get that reference, I just can't help you. Now back to the Brothers Cordry, we've got the better known Rob. How do you prevent people from bringing firearms into the stadium? Basically, it's site inspection. Yeah, well, what about these guns? He's obviously skyrocketed since The Daily Show with roles in Hot Tub Time Machine, Ballers, and Children's Hospital, which he created. I gave myself a really crappy job to do. It's like, I don't, uh, no, he's kind of the straight man, and I've got to wear this god-awful makeup every day. It's not itchy. It's not itchy. Here comes what I'm calling the loyalty section, because look how many of these former correspondents ended up on The Office. Like Larry Wilmore, and of course, Ed Helms. Oompa, loompa, doompa dee, dawsum. Dwight is now gone, which is totally awesome. Then there's Nancy Walls, who you can see here with Steve Carell in the early days of The Daily Show. Well, that's all the time we've got. I'm Steve Carell. And I'm Nancy Walls. Until next time, you'll see us hoping to see celebrities. Good night. And she was in The 40-Year-Old Virgin. I think some of the people here might be sexually inexperienced. Is it true that if you don't use it, you lose it? Is that a serious question? No, it wasn't. And as Carell's realtor slash girlfriend in the office. And then I just need you to sign here at this era. What kind of mortgage did you get? Uh, 10 year. Well, 10 over 30, so 30 year total. What? What? You said 10. 10 year fixed. Over 30, 30 year total. Rachel Harris was a correspondent and has since been in a ton of stuff. For example, here she is with Ed Helms in The Hangover. Oh my God. What happened to your tooth? Have you met Alan? Tracy's brother. Brother of the... Okay. Ow. That is disgusting. Why haven't you returned my calls? Well, there was a snafu and, and when we stopped... I called that bed and breakfast in Napa. They said they had no record of you even checking in. Olivia Munn did The Daily Show and Attack of the Show before playing an anchor on the newsroom. How long did it take you to know what you know? College, grad school, doctorate, postdoctorate, practical experience. 
15 years. When's the panel? Tuesday. Okay. Morning. How about I give you three things you can write on your hand? No, I want to know this. I think that a lot of what's going on in the world has to do with the economy. You may be honest. It's not like I need to know everything. You'll be in no danger of that. So that role was a real stretch. Josh Gad? Yep, but pre-Olaf, obviously. All right, let's start this thing over. Hi, everyone. I'm Olaf, and I like warm hugs. One of my favorite correspondence stories from The Daily Show involves this guy. For more on the issue in Ferguson, Missouri, we turn to senior uh, Missouri correspondent Michael Che. Michael, um, to, uh, talk to us very briefly. Um, what, what is the mood on the street right now in, in Ferguson? Beats me, I'm not there. Sit tight for some more Stuart love because Che was on the show for only about three months when he got another job offer. Oh. Well, tonight is the last show of the season and Che and I have decided that our end of the year gifts to each other would be jokes. Yeah, so we're making each other read jokes live on air that the other person has never seen before. <laughs> Doctors in Iowa have confirmed a dog disease that can be passed on to humans. Fine, I'll wear a condom. <laughs> And Stewart encouraged him to take it, immediately understood what an opportunity it was, and didn't hold Che back at all. Every boss should be like this, wanting you to be as successful as possible. It's not gonna happen, but we can hope. Now we get to the list of gents who got their own successful shows after TDS, like... So we're happy to welcome back to the program our senior international correspondent from South Africa, Trevor Noah's here! Trevor! <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank, thank you for being here. Uh, obviously, we're all still reeling from the terrible events of January 7th. Oh, right. No, that's uh, the uh, Charlie Hebdo massacre of Paris. That was, uh... Oh, well, well that, that too. Uh, but I was actually talking about the Baga and Doran Baga massacres in Nigeria. Yes. Noah obviously took over after Stewart left. Who else we got? Welcome back for more on the gun debate. We're bringing the first part of a three-part series with John Oliver. Yesterday, Americans watched in shock as even watered-down gun legislation died on the floor of the Senate. But that is exactly where it belongs, according to gun lobbyists like Philip Van Cleve of the Virginia Citizens Defense League. The Second Amendment, you know, is, is sacrosanct. You hold up this sign whenever I make a suggestion that you think is infringing upon your Second Amendment rights, okay? Okay. Assault weapons ban. Boom, there it is. And since then, he's stuck with some of the same topics. the NRA, a group that feels about guns the way the rest of us feel about Nutella. A little is good, more is better, and you can tell me it's bad for me all you like, but you will pry it from my cold, dead hands. And last but not least, no, I didn't forget him. I know that you lost the mayor to and now you're running for president. Seems backwards, but, but what, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, I'm gonna win. <laughs> it's that I'm, I'm rested, I'm ready. I'm thin. Which, of course, led to... Internet equality is more important than ever, as I learned this weekend, when the interwebs tried to swallow me whole. But I am proud to say that I got lodged in its throat and it hacked me back up like a hastily chewed chicken wing. Coughed back up right into one of the most coveted late night gigs. Welcome uh, to The Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. The combination of Stuart's sense of comedy and all that karma from his mentionist, that might not be a word, will likely make Irresistible, well, live up to the name. So that's gonna do it for your cinephile and Irresistible. You are now more movie-minded before you see it. My name's Silent K saying be kind, rewind. They're getting desperate. They don't know us. They don't want to know us. And they look no, down on our No, no, that's we. You're DC elite. Oh, no, actually, I'm from here. Faith, I didn't know that. You're from Wisconsin? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, no, Dear Lincoln. I'm from Dear Lincoln. What? Oh. Whoa. Wow, so this campaign has been a bit of a homecoming. It really is, Brooke. Thank no, you. No, 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 no. That's a lie. That's a lie. No, it's... You're lying. It's, it's She's lying. That that's no... Here. That's... What are you even <laughs> okay. doing? Well, that's here. always a great here. and Thank spirited you so much. discussion. No, hey, no, Thank no, you. No, 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 no. She's lying. To leave it She's here. Thanks for watching The Cinephile. While you're here, why don't you subscribe, ring that bell, and like the video. And feel free to leave a comment. I mean, what else are you going to do? The Jim and Pam wedding episode is going to end the same way.